is risen. Once more with feeling. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. We'll get there. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Cooperstown. My name is Pastor Jess Lambert. To you at home, uh, worshiping with us online, you here within these four walls, all are welcome on this glorious day of celebration. One thing I want to be sure to remind you of is that uh, please come and have fellowship with us uh, when our worship has ended in the chapel this way. Um, and today will be a special um, a time of fellowship. It is Easter, it is time to celebrate and rejoice with one another, um, and there, is, there are lots of goodies. Uh, there are, I see, at least one announcement um, from John Carl. Thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm John Davis, and I'm delighted to be back. And I want to especially thank Pam Washburn over here for, for bringing me to and from church. Thank you very much, Pam. And I want to let you know that I'm now living at the Thanksgiving home. Thank you. Would you join me now, please, for the call to worship, which is in your bulletin? Sorry, there's a Coral Detroit first. Sorry, that's my fault. That would be nice. <laughs> Join me, please, in the call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Our first hymn is number 232. Jesus Christ is risen today. You know this song, so we need to hear it. <laughs>
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter and our joy. Amen. Amen. Look, here is the Lamb of God, our crucified and living God. Here, here is, is our, our water of life. life. Alleluia. Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We, we give, give you thanks, thanks O God, God, for in the beginning, beginning your voice thundered over the deep, and water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant rivers. The ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land. In a desert pool, the Ethiopian official entered your boundless baptismal life. Look. Here is the Lamb of God, our crucified and living Lord. Here, Here is our water of life. Alleluia. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed by the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you opened the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you. Through the risen Christ, our source of living water, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is number 244, Joyful Eastertide. <laughs>
<clears throat> Pray with me, please. Open our eyes and soften our hearts, O God, through the work of your Holy Spirit, that in the hearing of your word, we may receive new life. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, starting at verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich fill food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all people, the covering that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, see, this is the Lord, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The next scripture is from the book of Acts, chapter 10. <clears throat> then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every people, anyone who fears him and practices righteousness is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching Christ, peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, 
beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witness to all that he had did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and of the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The next hymn is In Your Bulletin. <clears throat> standing for a few moments. There are four different versions of the resurrection story. Each of the four Gospels tells the story slightly differently. And yet the people who put the Bible together allowed these inconsistencies to remain side by side. I think they thought that faithful thinking Christians could handle it. Another reminder that while the Bible is to be taken seriously, it is not meant to be taken literally. We are meant to learn from the contradictions, the paradoxes, the diversity. Our faith grows stronger precisely in those places. So if we take the Bible seriously, we take these little differences among the Gospels seriously as well. We ask ourselves, which of the peculiarities matter in this story? What's the lesson in this version for us today? So as you hear the resurrection story from the Gospel of John, ask yourselves these questions. What is being lifted up? Who is being lifted up as especially important? And why might that be? What details stand out to you? Who gets to see Jesus first, and who does not? And why is that? The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary, stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw the two two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's continue to sing our hymn, verses 5 through 8, in your bulletin. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Mary Magdalene took her time. She was lost in the long winter of grief. 
like the ice that surrounded us just last weekend encasing each branch of every tree and our cars in inches of a hard, cold blanket. So it was with her sadness. She was also persistent. She was unshakable in her faith, yet she was not in a rush. In every gospel, she is at the empty tomb, a key figure whose attendance remains undisputed. Mary Magdalene was persistent. She had an unshakable trust in God's promise and an unquenchable love for Jesus, her Rabuni. She had every reason to be afraid, to remain out of sight with the other followers of Jesus. In his crucifixion, Mary had witnessed an unspeakable act of state-sponsored terror. She knew she could be in danger herself. But Mary Magdalene was persistent, unshakable in her faith, unquenchable in her love. And so early in the morning on that first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away. The other disciples in this story, Peter and John, were in a hurry. So much in a hurry, they actually raced to the tomb, raced each other to see who could get there first. And that gets recorded in scripture. John, the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, was the winner. At least he was the winner in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of his followers. The winner gets to write the history. Again, these little quirks in the Gospels remind us that the Bible is God's word mediated through some real human personalities. But even in John's gospel, Mary Magdalene is the most important person right now. After Peter and John have rushed in and then rushed out again and back to the rest of the disciples, she remains. She spends some time in the empty tomb. She peers in there, that place where she expected to encounter death. That's what she came prepared for, to attend to the dead body. She wasn't prepared for the stone rolled away, the clothes rolled up, the angels hanging out, the body missing. She remains, though. She spends time weeping. And it is then that she sees Jesus at first thinking him the gardener because he looks different. For one thing, he's alive. And if there's one thing she knows for sure, her Jesus was executed right before her eyes and put inside that tomb. But the resurrected Jesus looks different in all the gospel stories. He was not immediately recognizable to those who ran into him after Easter, even his closest companions. They had to stop. They had to spend some time with him. They had to hear his voice speak their names. They had to eat with him, see his wounds. And then after that, they recognized him. But it took a little time. Time is something we are not very free with in our society. We hold it very close. We are careful where we spend it. In fact, I think we're freer with our money than with our time. We'll spend money on incredibly silly, useless things. I deserve this, we say. I worked hard. I'm treating myself. But when you ask someone for their time, they hesitate. They're scrolling their calendar in their head or on their phone, but they're hedging. They sigh. They feel the need to tell you how little of it they have. The only sociably acceptable answer to the question, how are you, has become busy. I'm so busy. 
How are the kids? Oh, you know, busy. Mom, can you? No, no, I'm busy. How's retirement treating you? Ah, oh, busier than ever. To which our societal chorus responds, good. As if being busy is a sign that life is as it should be. Busy means productive. Busy means you have a purpose. Busy means your kids are successful. After all, you have to play a lot of sports and musical instruments to be busy. You have to have an important job for it to keep you busy. You have to have the most interesting hobbies with lots of paraphernalia to be busy. You have to be a superhuman parent, the most devoted kind, to be busy. Heaven forbid you not be busy. Nonsense. This Easter, I am putting busyness on notice. I want to burst the busyness bubble. It's holding us captive, and it's telling us lies. There are some things that nobody admits to in our busyness worshiping society, but they may ring true to you as people of faith, even those of you too busy to hear it. First, a lot of the things that keep us busy are not actually important. They are not important, but they are things that we are used to doing, and so we simply continue to do them without actually stopping to ask why. Also, a lot of the things that keep us busy are things that are not important, but we do them for good reasons, like not wanting to feel pain, emotional or spiritual pain that lies just below the surface of our lives. If we stopped all the busyness, even for a few minutes, it will come rising up. It will make us feel hurt or scared or bored or lonely or doubtful or betrayed. And those feelings are not enjoyable. We might fear they will overwhelm us. And so that they don't, we are busy. To everyone else, maybe even to ourselves, we're fine. We're living the dream. We're busy. We have stuff to do. We're important. Isn't that proof that we're OK? I remember once when I was complaining about being too busy, a wise person asked me if I had ever done a time exercise. She suggested that I write out my values, my general philosophy about what I wanted to spend my time on. You can imagine the categories, time with family, friends, helping others, cooking, reading, serving the community, working, exercising, praying. I wonder what your categories might be. Well, then this exercise demanded that I sit down with my calendar and look at the last three months of my life and mark each hour I had spent in any of those categories. And at the end, I was supposed to rank the categories in order of the time I had actually spent in them and see if there was a disconnect. Well, there certainly was. For one thing, I hadn't even thought to have one of my categories be streaming Netflix, but according to my calendar, it was one of my core values. <laughs> if you asked me if I appreciated nature and God's creation, I would have said, oh my gosh, yes. And if you asked me how important I thought sitting in front of a computer is, I would say, not very. It drives me crazy. But my calendar told another story. Try this exercise. It's jarring, especially to those of us who think we know ourselves. Engaging time, really looking at how you spend it is a profoundly spiritual issue. And we should engage it spiritually. We are used to the idea that God blesses us 
God blesses people, maybe even that God blesses places or objects, but we forget that time belongs to God, that God hallows time. The establishment of the Sabbath during the creation of the universe shows just how much God cares about time. God has built into the fabric of creation the sacredness of doing nothing, of rest, of not being busy, of contemplation and community and peace. How as a world will we ever not be at war with each other if we cannot stop the busyness of our minds and our hearts and our souls so that we can truly see and hear and feel and appreciate and recognize one another. We will not. And I also have a warning. Do not, for example, as people of faith, opt for a secular solution like time management. Time management, as an expression, says a whole lot. Because who, who really manages time? Not human beings, but God. God created time and did not create time for us to manage. God created time for us to appreciate, to come home to God, ourselves, and each other. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So the first shift might be from time management to time appreciation. What would our calendars look like if we viewed time not as something to be managed, but as something to be cherished? Mary Magdalene learned this lesson the way many of us learn it. She learned to cherish time when the person she most wanted to spend time with was gone. Jesus had died so unjustly, so cruelly, so unfairly young, and Mary with the other disciples must have been performing her own version of the time exercise. Lost in the long winter of grief, they must have asked, did we spend our time with Jesus wisely? Did we talk about the right things, the most important things? Which category did the hours fall into? If we could have more time, what would we do now? Unlike most of us, Mary had her chance to do more than imagine that. In the resurrection, Jesus truly returned to her. Peter and John rushed off. They, they had news to spread. They were busy. They were doubtful. But Mary, persistent, unshakable, unquenchable, had taken time to simply sit in the grave, to sit in the moment and grieve. She got more time. But let's remember the reason she got that time with the risen Christ is that she stopped, she remained, she gave that time to this moment. The promise of the resurrection is that, that we will get more time. We will get it on the other side of this life. We will live again and see each other again and know God and all the answers to our questions. That's the promise. The ultimate sentence of death has been defeated forever. It has lost its sting. But in the meantime, shouldn't that good news affect the way we live while we're still here on God's good earth? Jesus' resurrection means that we do not have to be afraid, that we do not have to hide who we are, that we are not alone, that we are not defined by our worst mistake or by our most brilliant success. We're defined by the love of a God who can and does bring into being things that are not, 
who can and does forgive sins and wipe our slates clean, who can and does take all of the dead places in our lives and in our world and brings life and hope, who can and does give us time as a gift to cherish. In this God, because of Christ, you are a new creation and everything old has passed away. Busy, busy, busy. What if being busy is keeping us from healing? What if being busy is a denial of the gifts God has given us? What if being busy is keeping us from our most important work, which is loving one another in all of this freedom we have been given? In the empty tomb, Mary found Jesus alive. The shroud of death was rolled up in its place, discarded and defeated. In the empty spaces, may you find him too. In the people you love, in the time you have been given. Let's stop managing time, which we can't do anyway, and instead appreciate it and cherish it as God's gift. No more time management, only time appreciation. No more busy, 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 wheels turning. Just thankful, thankful, thankful. For Jesus is risen. Alleluia. Amen. We have heard God's word of mercy and grace and unending love of rest and peace. And now we offer with thankful hearts our tithes and offerings to the work God is doing in this place.
Let us pray. Holy God, you shower us with gifts so abundant we cannot measure them all. You give us life itself and time and the power and grace to befriend our companions in this world. Bless these gifts for the sake of those in need. And we especially ask for your blessing upon our gifts for the one great hour of sharing initiative that we have undertaken during Lent, the offerings which go towards disaster relief all over the world, wherever it is most needed. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, I invite uh, your joys and thanksgivings, your gratitudes, um, things you would like lifted up in our time of prayer. I have so much gratitude for everyone in the congregation that showed love and support with prayers and phone calls and cards uh, with my mother's passing. And I have a joy. Today my daughter will be coming to spend Easter with me, which mm -hmm. is amazing. So, thank you. I have two concerns. Um, I want to, prayers for my, the family of Susan Corzat was a friend of mine for 85 years. She died this week, the day after her 93rd birthday. Mm -hmm. And I want prayers for her family. And then I would like prayers to continue for Michael Woodring. He's going in this week. Hopefully they're gonna find some other treatment for him. My joy is the music today and especially the music of the little people mm. whose little voices Amen. made me laugh and feel good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our joy is that we have so many of our family here together today. And also gratitude for this congregation that puts up with the little wiggly ones <laughs> and the noise that sometimes comes with them. So Thank you. <laughs> Jim. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Two weeks ago, I asked for prayers for a good friend who has a bad uh, diagnosis of colorectal cancer. This week, his wife is also facing a different kind of cancer. I don't want to say their names. Um, it would be very obvious who they were, but just please hold prayers for my good friends as they go through this next months of hospital visits and trauma. Thank you. Prayers for William and Sarah Cohey. William is hospitalized in upstate. Um, and also for Kathy Allen, who is recovering from acute appendicitis. I just wanted to express a joy that happens every Easter. Um, the way I know Dr. Subhashini Daniel is that a colleague of mine's parents uh, retired to Delaware County, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, I don't even know. And they're not religious people, but somehow in their hearts, around Easter every year they call me and they say, Dr. Daniel saved my father's life. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna say, I think what a service Dr. Daniel's provided. We're gonna miss her when she goes to her next job, but I really want to say that while her mom is here and while her daughter is here, mm -hmm. so thank you and your brother and, and your entire family. So anyway, but this happens every Easter, but this was the Easter I wanted to mention it.
So thank you for that. And I just wanted to say thank you to this church, especially because you welcomed my daughter and I here 10 years ago for Easter. That's the first time we attended here. And it's been a wonderful, uh, beautiful 10 years. And I'm very joyful actually to have my mom, my brother, my cousin, and of course my daughter who's been in Boston here. So thank you all very much. I would ask you to keep Stan and Jewel Hall in your prayers as they are going through a difficult time. <clears throat> More than 40 years have passed since I first came to this church in April of 1983, and I don't believe I've, I've attended many worship services, certainly not every Sunday, but most over that time, and I don't remember ever hearing the music of all these children in a service here. It's really a pleasure to hear so many children's voices. It, it's a chorus of love. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Holy God, we pray for the body of Christ, the church. Where the church is persecuted, protect it. Where the church is privileged, grant it humility. Where the church is fractured, heal it. Guide us all to embody Christ's love in the world. We give you thanks for this congregation, where love is outpoured among the sick, the lonely, those in any need where prayers are lifted up and soup is delivered, cards arrive in the mail, and the power of love works its healing work. God of grace, hear our prayer. Life-giving God, we pray for the earth, your good creation. Join our prayers with branches lifted in praise, with birds singing their hymns, and the roaring waters of new life, that together we may proclaim Easter hope. God of grace, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for all peoples and nations, free oppressed communities from occupation, exploitation, and abuse. Teach leaders your way of justice. Empower peacemakers and all who work to end violence and strife especially in Ukraine, in Russia, Haiti, Venezuela and El Salvador, Israel and Palestine, Senegal, Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Africa. God of grace, hear our prayer. Liberating God, we pray for people everywhere who long for good news. Roll away the stones that keep people from living with dignity and wholeness. Breathe new life and hope into people struggling to make it through each day. Give strength to those who use busyness to hide from the truth, from their pain, from their loneliness. Help us to cherish time, the time you have given us to be human beings, not human doings. We pray for the sick and the grieving, for those who suffer in any way, in mind, body, and spirit. We pray for Stan and Jewel, Kathy, for beloved friends with cancer, for a beloved friend being treated for a brain bleed, for William and Sarah, and for all who are in our hearts and minds this day. God of grace, 
hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for this community of faith and for your spirit in our midst, your spirit whom we hear in the voices of children, reminding us of what you have called us to be and the ways in which you have taught us to receive our faith like children who laugh and sing and know not our self-consciousness, who are joyful and remind us of the joy you give us. Feed us at your Easter table and fill us with your wisdom that we may serve and care for others. And we give you thanks this day for all who celebrate with loved ones and family members who have traveled from near or far to be together. God of grace, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we remember those who have gone before us in death. Especially today, we remember Pauline Brannigan. Renew our trust in your promises that we live with joyful courage and compassion. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love. Through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In every time and every age, O God, it is good and faithful that we give you thanks. For your mercy is sure and your steadfast love endures. In your compassion, you gave us Christ Jesus, who freed us from darkness and lights our path to endless renewal and life eternal. And so with all of creation, with all the needy and hungry ones, with all those who have enough and plenty, with creatures large and small, with sun and moon and stars, and with the saints of every age, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O God, creator of all things. By your power and love, you continue to deliver your people from bondage, thwart the designs of evil, show the way through the wilderness, Turn hardship into righteousness and reveal your hand upholding the just. Blessed are you, O Christ, servant of the universe. You came among us to feed and heal and teach, to confound the haughty, confuse the tricksters, to challenge the wrong-hearted, and in all these things, to give hope to those who long for peace. We remember that in the night on which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering our Lord's self-giving love, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
Blessed are you, O Spirit, giver of life. You give us words when we have none. You fill us with vision when we have the most need. You give us voice to proclaim our faith in every hour. Be our guide, comforter, and teacher today and always. Come now, O Prince of Peace, Spirit of love, breath of life. Bring to all this hurting world the joy that Mary knew and teach us to proclaim with her, I have seen the Lord. In the unity of the Holy Trinity, in gratitude for this great day of resurrection, we praise you, O God, of all that is, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we now pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are going to share communion today by intinction. Starting with the first pews, you are invited to come forward. Um, I will be giving bread. September has the juice that you may dip into. Um, for those who need or would like to remain in your pews, Carol will be bringing you communion where you are. If you need gluten-free bread, that is Susan and then John um, with the chalice there. So the table is ready. If it's messy, it's messy, but let's start with the first pews. Please come this way and then go back to your pews and along the side. Um, yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs>
Please stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Please join me in the post-communion prayer in your bulletin. Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Our final hymn is in your insert. Now all the vault of heaven resounds. May the truth of the empty tomb, the astonishing reality of Jesus' resurrection, keep you fearless 
and sure that you will see the resur resurrected one again and again in this life and in the life to come. May the power of God's endless love surround you and guide you this day and always. Amen.